from this subject, faith that moves you to the front of the line. Faith that moves you to the front of the line. Amen. I'm getting my blessing ahead of time. Hallelujah. Because my faith is going to move me to the front of the the line. Father, may we do no damage, but preach that which becometh sound doctrine and gospel in Jesus' name. Amen. It is biblical, it is scriptural, it is right, it is orthodox, it is wise. It is life-saving, it is joy-giving to learn the lessons of how uh, to wait on the Lord. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 28 through 31 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increaseth their strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk, the Bible says, and not Psalms 34, Psalms 37, excuse me, and 34 says, wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. And everybody knows uh, the words of David when he said in Psalms 27, 13 through 14, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Even the passage from the text that God gave us to preach as we preach Tasha's story during the eulogy in Hebrews chapter 10 and Verse 36, the Hebrew writer says, you have need of patience. That after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. There are endless blessings uh, and teachings. There are endless blessings that come from learning how to wait on God. There are endless scriptures teaching us to wait on the Lord. Don't let the devil make you impatient. Don't let Satan cause you to give up on your dreams. Don't let the devil talk you out of believing that God's going to do what God's going to do. Amen. When the Lord makes a promise, he keeps it. We were studying today in uh, our 8 a.m. class how that the nation of Israel as a nation exists today. Mainly for one reason. Because God promised that it would exist. America as we know it will eventually go down the tubes. 
Other nations and kingdoms have risen and fallen. The Reich, the Third Reich of Hitler, oh my, in their attempt to exterminate the Jews, they're gone. Other nations that were great became either non-existent non-existent or small nations themselves when they rose up against Israel. And the world said in Jeremiah's day that Israel, that Zion, Israel, Jacob would be an outcast. And God said, not because, Jacob, you are so right, but because the nation says that you're going to be an outcast. I'm going to make sure that that never comes to pass because God made a promise with Abram when he established the Jewish race from the beginning. He says, and, and I will bless him that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. And through thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Israel will always be because God has deemed it so. I haven't read in the Bible where we're going to see a new America, but I've read where there will be a new Jerusalem. See? Amen. That shall proceed out of the throne of God. Our God keeps his word. So if you're waiting on a promise from the Lord, don't let anyone or anything talk you out of it. But on the other hand, there are times when God will move us to the front of the line. When God will shift the timetable and give you a blessing even before you thought that he would. It would happen so fast that you could hardly keep up with it. There are times when God blesses us ahead of time. Our text records one of those times. The Lord told me to tell you that this woman represents some of us here today. She is us, those who will believe God, and Jesus will move on our behalf as he moved on hers. Our text, bear with me if you please, describe Jesus' ministry in the Galilee area when he but when he left Galilee and went to Tyre, Zidon, and the Decapolis. Amen. He went northwest up toward the coast of the mighty Mediterranean. And when he left there, according to verse 21 of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, the Bible says... Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Zidon. These two port cities, on the coast of the Mediterranean, north of Galilee, were denounced in Isaiah chapter 23 and Ezekiel chapter 28. They were denounced by God and considered by the first century Jew to be notoriously wicked and deserving of divine wrath. These were cursed areas. Isaiah 23 and 1, God tells Tyre to, to howl, scream because of what's going to happen. Ezekiel 28 and 22, the Lord says to Zadon, I am against thee, O Zadon. These were wicked areas. Are you following me? And 
If you look at Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, verse 20 through 24, you see some interesting things that our Lord said about this area. Verse 20 of Matthew's gospel, chapter 11, Then began he to upbraid the cities, wherein his most mighty works were done, because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, to thee, Bethsaida. This is the Galilean ministry. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Zidon, or Tyre and Zidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum, these Galilean cities, especially Capernaum, was considered to be our Lord's base, his headquarters on earth. So he did powerful miracles regularly in these areas. And up until now, he had performed no miracles in Tyre and Zidon had left this region of Phoenicia out of the miracles of God. He said, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Zidon in the day of judgment than for you. Let me say this. I want to say this. Those of you who are here, who, all of us who live in America, who live in a country where there's almost a church on every corner. A Bible, the Bible is readily available everywhere. 24 hour Christian preaching, teaching, it's on the radio, it's on the social media, it's on television, the gospel is everywhere. It's online. People have gospel apps everywhere. The word of God is just readily available everywhere. Church every Sunday. Some organizations every Wednesday night. Church of God in Christ twice a week. Church. Sunday morning, Sunday night. Amen. Nobody goes to jail in this country for being a Christian. No one gets arrested yet for being a Christian. All right? Praise the Lord. We have relatively little resistance in comparison to communist countries, uh, Islamic countries, Buddhist countries. Praise the Lord. Communist countries. Socialist countries. In the day of judgment, the judgment will be more severe for us than it will be for people who live in those countries where they didn't have it like we have it. See, you are responsible for the gospel you hear, for the truth that is exposed. Or, or reveal to you. You're responsible. Oh my. Some of us God is just downright. Disappointed with. That's been too much preaching. Too much teaching. Too much Bible study. For you to struggle so much. Too much truth has been revealed. For you to be confused. On such. On black and white issues. Too much. God will not judge a Christian who came up in Calcutta, India, one of the poorest spots on this planet, in the midst of a Hindu country. They probably never had a convocation or a workers' meeting that they could attend. Never had any of the sophisticated religious advantages that we have. 
And yet many of them are much closer to Jesus than we are. I talked with Sister Katina Samuels. I talked with Evangelist Wilborn, Mother Weeks, and Brother Carl Reeves. They've just gotten back from the Dominican Republic. And the joy of Jesus that's on those people. Comparatively speaking, they live in squalor compared to us. Working toilets and bathrooms as we know them doesn't exist. The kinds of things that we take for granted Where we say, preacher, hurry up and get through. They want to know why didn't you preach longer? In the day of judgment. In the day of judgment. It will be more tolerable for them than it will be for us. Oh, 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 oh. People have more mercy for folk who grew up in an orphanage grew up being shipped from house to house grew up not knowing who their parents are and they struggle in life people have more patience for that individual than the same man who makes the same mistakes but he had a mama and a daddy a college education, every opportunity, and both of you are homeless on the street. It ain't the same. It's not the same. They may be in the same location, but it's not the same. How are you going to be on the side of the street with a sign up that says, we'll work for food, and all the rules were made for you in your favor? It's not the same. In the day, I got to get back to my text, but I, I, th I think I better bring this in, though, and, and, and point this out to you, because you need to know that God holds us responsible for the gospel that we hear, for the teachings that we're given. It's not for you to just sit and enjoy and say, did not did not our hearts burn? But that, that has to be a response, because the more you're exposed to, the higher the expectation to whom much is given. Much is required. Will you say amen? amen? So Jesus said to those cities whom he worked many miracles for. It's a little, little warm in here, brethren. He says, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you and thou Capernaum which are exalted to heaven. The reason he called Capernaum exalted to heaven is because that was his main launching base. He says, which art exalted to heaven shall be brought down to hell, for if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have long remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. There's a judgment coming, saints. So Tyre and Zadon were viewed as wicked cities, lost people, praise the Lord, and the Jews had nothing to do with them. Our text is the only recording in the scripture. It's the only recorded instance where our Lord actually leaves Palestine. Where he actually leaves Israel. He leaves Galilee and he goes to Tyre and Zadon and to the ten cities. 
I know I'm being repetitive, but it's the it's a teaching style. You, you hear it enough, it'll get in your spirit. Amen. These towns were best known for their sin and for their fierce independence and their frequent battles. They weren't calm cities. <laughs> they fought a lot. They were independent. They were unruly. And Jesus went there after he made some foundation-shaking statements about religion. After he made those statements, he withdrew. It shook the, the Christian, not the Christian, the Judaistic world when our Lord began to teach that true sins come from the heart. And not just from disobeying some outward rituals. Jesus said in chapter 15 verse 17. Do you not understand that, that, that whatsoever entereth into in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draw. But those things which proceedeth out of the mouth cometh from the heart. And they are the things that defile a man. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But going by your rule to eat with unwashed hands, this doesn't defile a man. Man, it's good hygiene to wash your hands, but you don't get spiritually defiled because you've eaten with unwashed hands. Otherwise, he was telling them, you guys are washing your hands, but you got dirty hearts. See, your hearts are filled with fornications and, and all kinds of murders and adulteries. You won't even obey me, but you, you'll stick to your ceremonial cleansings. So after Jesus made this statement, uh, he withdrew. He said, now is a good time for me to kind of step off the scene. Psychologist, psychologist ad identifies three ways of resolving conflict. And those three ways are fight, flight, or compromise. Any of these used to the extreme makes one emotionally sick. None of the three are to be utilized all the time. But a healthy person knows when to fight, knows when to flee, and knows when to compromise. Jesus withdrew himself. And according to Mark's gospel, chapter 7 and verse 24, he didn't go to Tyre and Zidane to save anybody. He didn't go to this wicked area to win any of those wicked people to himself. Mark tells us in chapter 7, verse 24, that he entered into a house and would have no man know it. He didn't want anyone to even know he was there. He took a sabbatical. Jesus went there to rest. The Bible says, but he could not be hid. So he's in a house trying to rest Praise the Lord. And uh, you see, saints, even Jesus had to get some rest. He, he's, he's in the house, him and his disciples, trying to rest. And while trying to rest, the Bible says, Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, Matthew tells us. Now Mark chapter 7 and verse 26 tells us that this woman, to whom Matthew referred to as a woman of Canaan, Mark said she was a Greek. There's no contradiction. And this was the same woman. She was called a, she was a Gentile woman living as a Greek. That is, she was Hellenized. And, uh, and she was, according to Mark 7 and 26, a Syro-Phoenician. She was a Phoenician 
from Syria. Phoenicia was the area that Tyre and Sidon were in. So this Syro-Phoenician woman, Gentile woman, came to Jesus. Jesus was in Gentile territory. There to get some rest. Can I talk about this woman for a moment? This woman had to feel, uh, district missionary, that everything was against her. Her nationality was against her. She was a Gentile, and Jesus was a Jew. And the Jews had no dealings with the Gentiles. She was a woman. That was working against her because in those days, society was dominated by men. Satan was against her. Her daughter had been overtaken by a demon. Yes, and uh, the disciples were against her. They considered her a nuisance. Said, Lord, do whatever it takes to just get rid of her. Isn't that something? We see that even Jesus seemed to be against her. For he resisted her. I've never read why Jesus resisted anybody who wanted to be healed before. But he resisted her. And not only did he resist her, he ignored her. When she made her request, the Bible said, and he answered her not a word. And he resisted her because the truth is... Truth is, it wasn't her turn. It wasn't her time. Keep in mind, I'm preaching about getting your blessing ahead of time. Yes, according to the text, she had a lot to contend with. She had a lot to overcome. Verse 22 says, and behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast, and she cried, she screamed, she yelled out unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter, my little girl, is grievously vexed with a devil. Grievously vexed. Grievously. Vexed is bad enough. But grievously vexed. The daughter was uncontrollable. Inconsolable. The daughter said things that she shouldn't have said. Behaved in wicked ways that she shouldn't have behaved in. Demonic. The, the, the manifestations of the, of the demons were... ah. Uh, Obvious in her daughter. And this woman came to the house where Jesus was and she told him of her case. And you have to admit, uh, uh, it was a, a legitimate case to bring to Jesus. It was one of those things that would be beneath him. So you don't, walk, you don't roll up on Jesus and say, my daughter has a cold. Go to Walgreens for that. You don't, you don't bother Jesus and say, my child has a cough. <coughs> oh, that's, that's nothing. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. What did loving, kind, wonderful, sweet Jesus do? The Bible teaches, uh, verse 23, the A-clause says, but he answered her, not a word. Have you ever been while you prayed and God didn't say a word? That's something when you don't hear anything from him. He answered her, not a word. Praise the Lord. And, and notice now, you got to pay attention to how the Bible is written. 
And, and his disciples came to him. You see, when you're paying attention, he answered another word, period. Uh, there's time between word and the word and. He didn't say anything, but she kept talking. And since she wouldn't shut up, the disciples came and besought Jesus, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. When I read this particular passage, I think about cruel kindness. Because when they said send her away, what they were saying, they weren't saying boot her out. They were saying, would you please heal this woman's daughter so that she will shut up and leave. In other words, give her what she wants because we're not here to do ministry. We are here to take a break. Now, now I'm going to be honest with you. I know the feeling. Oh, let me tell you, in greater North Carolina, now, you know, our B Bishop Leroy Jackson Woolard is a, a man machine. He don't seem to run out of energy. He'll get up and tell you, I'm not going to detain you with a lengthy message. Two and a half hours later, he's still preaching. Some of you probably say the same thing about me. But anyway, anyway. When we've been at the convocation, we've been there all week. And when you're part of the team, yeah. see, there is church attendance, and then there is church attendance. Right. When you are involved, you're really a team. Right. But then there are those who show up at night, maybe one or two nights out the whole meeting, Amen. and say, I went to the, I, I was at the convocation. Amen. Ask those of us who attend. Amen. Two nights don't count as attending. We, we, we put more time in that in a day session. Amen. We're there night and day. Day and night. So by official night, uh, we, they normally sang about five songs. One of the things I told them when I became prelate, I said on official day, we will not sing that many songs. Put me up, put me up, put me up. We've been there all week, put me up. If you notice, uh, we, we still hadn't figured out to, uh, how to get out a little faster. <laughs> I, I got to work on some others. Some other, a few more areas. But mother, I'm working on them though. So... So we're standing up there. Bishop is preaching. We're tired. We're blessed of the Lord. We've been there all week. And then somebody shows up the first night. And for the last night of the meeting, hadn't been there all meeting long. All week long. Oh, we're ready to go. And Bishop opens the altar for souls. Or for somebody to come and get blessed. And you stand there thinking because you're tired. God knows you're tired. So-and-so better not get up. <laughs> you better not get in this line. <laughs> and that's the main one. Come walking down there, throwing their hands up. Pray for me. You want to run down there and close line. Them. Just, ah, I got your blessing. <laughs> what are you... Where have you been all week? Now, I'm not talking about a lost person off the street. I'm talking about a church person. Then they pray for me. Boy, you just, I, I, I want to, I feel like dusty road. You, know, you remember? <laughs> so, now, I, I understand the guys, which is my point. They, they were tired. Jesus was tired. And, and, and it's not even... Her turn, she's a Gentile. Are you praying for me? And she show up saying, my daughter is grievously vexed. She's grievously vexed. The divine resistance, Jesus says nothing. Jesus resents her, resists her, and his disciples, they come to her and say, Lord, will you please... Heal this woman's child. She has a big mouth. She's a nuisance. She won't go away. Give her what she wants. I know, amen, that that was what they meant because I'm going to show you Jesus' response. Gives light on what I'm telling you. Now, 
uh, uh, Mark's gospel chapter 7 and verse 27 tells us that when, when Jesus finally did speak up, when he broke his silence, yeah, what he had to say wasn't in the woman's favor. He said in Mark 7 and 27, but Jesus said unto her, let the children be filled first. Not her daughter, but Jewish people. Because salvation is of the Jews. I, I, I understand that your little girl is vexed. I understand your little Gentile daughter got a demon. But we ain't feeding the Gentiles yet. We're not healing them yet. We're going to do it, but not yet. You hear running your mouth, I want my daughter to get healed. He said, let the children be fed first. For it is not meat to take the children's bread and give it to dogs. Otherwise, it's not your turn. You and your demon-possessed daughter have got to wait in line like everyone else. In other words, there are others ahead of you. Keep in mind, I'm preaching about getting your blessing ahead of time. I'm preaching about Jesus moving you to the front of the line. Also, according to Matthew's gospel, chapter 15, and verse 24, Jesus said unto his disciples, he said to them, he said to them, but he answered and said, because they were saying, heal this woman's child and send her away. He says, but I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's not time for me to do what she wants. I'm not sent to her. He's talking to them. I'm not sent to her. You're telling me to heal her, but it's not time. It's not time. She and her daughter, according to Mark, were Syrophoenicians. Matthew doesn't trace their lineage through the, the Syrophoenicians. Matthew just calls her a woman of Canaan. You know, Matthew was kind of, why did he go there? Because the Canaanites were the ancient enemies of Israel. So he says, she's of an enemy descent. And she's coming with her enemy descent, wanting a healing at the front of the line. Woo! And uh, 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 then we see something here. I feel my help. That is just downright astonishing. <sighs> something that is so amazing. Something that deserves a pregnant pause. Her response. Daughter's sick. Her gender is against her. Her race is working against her. She's the only woman there, surrounded by all males. She calls out to Jesus. Jesus says nothing. The disciples call her a, 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 a nuisance. Nobody's being kind to her. What does she do? The Bible says in verse 15, in verse 25, then came she and worshiped him. I ain't never met anybody like her. She came and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. God Almighty. Uh, she didn't push back. She didn't get ugly. She didn't trade ins insults for insults. She didn't try to man manipulate Jesus. She didn't try to play a game. She came and she worshiped.
Worship here literally means, literally means, it means to kiss. It means to adore. It means to do obeisance. It means to show respect. It means to fall prostrate. It means to throw kisses. It means to, to give a token of respect. She just began to throw kisses at him. She just began to fall before him. She just began to show him great respect. And she began to say in the most loving and respectful, oh, in the most uh, the glorious way, she began to say, but Lord, help me. Help me, help me. Help me, help me. All of those men standing around, Jesus standing around. The lady's got her daughter on her mind, and she falls down and employs the most powerful tool in the Christian toolbox. She begins to worship. Had she been a modern woman, Jesus and his disciples would have been cussed out 10 ways from Sunday. You would have sent, uh, she would have left the church, left him and walked out and would have had nothing else to do with him. Instead, Brother told me one time, I said, Pastor, I left the church. That's why. Because I wanted a home and foreign mission. And y'all didn't help me that time. So I said, well, Brother, how many times have we helped? He told me. But one time. One time. See, some of you will never get a blessing that moves you to the front of the line because you don't know how to respond. You don't know how to, how, to, how to act when life resists you and when God don't give you everything you want. Some people get 80% of what they want and fall out over the 20. The woman began to worship. Worship the Lord. And, and uh, I, I could hear a voice. I could hear between the kisses. I could hear her. I could hear her between them kisses she was throwing at Jesus. Pray. I could hear. I could hear her voice, brethren, in that female tone. Lord, help me. Now you know that moves a man, and he's got the power to help. All power is in his hands. Oh Lord, and uh, Jesus is clearly moved. See, she clearly moved him because he did what people in positions of power do when they've been moved. That's right. He moves to procedure and he moves to, praise the Lord, precedence. He says, speaking of procedure and precedence, he, at verse 26, but he answered and said, it is not me. Mm -hmm. to take the children's bread and to give it to dogs. It is not constitutionally good. It is not a part of what we normally do. Meat, it is not beauty. It is not harmonious. It is not, uh, praise the Lord, the way it's supposed to be done. In other words, he was saying, even if I wanted to, this is not according to protocol. Then he draws an analogy of a rich man mm -hmm, with his children sitting at the table. And uh, praise the Lord, the, the children are fed. And while eating their food, the children get good and fed, but a little uh, crumb fall on the floor. I heard Jesus say to this lady, you're out of time. You're out of your turn. It's not proper for me to do this because you are not a Jew. It's not right for me to take the children's bread, I feel like preaching, and give it to dogs. Allow me to unpack dogs just a little. He wasn't talking about those mangy dogs who ran the streets of uh, Jerusalem eating out of trash cans. But he was talking about house-trained puppies. 
earth. People who had little dogs for pets. And those little dogs were treated like they were family members. And when the children would sit at the table and eat, the little dogs knew that it wouldn't be long before they got their blessing. So Jesus goes to the analogy of children sitting at a table. I thank God for this woman because she's a very fascinating woman. To me, she's one of the most fascinating women in all of scripture. Uh, she's unlike most today. She is in a desperate situation. Her daughter is demon possessed. Uh, she's a female in a male dominated environment. She was the only woman there. She was clearly not wanted. And she was asking for something that she didn't have a right to ask for. She wanted to be moved from the Gentile cable car to ride in first class with the Jews. Praise the Lord, she was a Rosa Parks. She had gotten tired of sitting at the back of the bus and she decided that day, I'm not getting up and giving a white man this seat. I'm tired, y'all. And I had this woman, a smart woman. See, ladies, you got to know how to use your strengths. Praise the Lord. She was a, a, a quick-witted woman. I'm trying to preach. I'm preaching better than you're saying amen. Well, what does she do? Thank you, Jesus. Because y'all do know that there were Jewish children that had demons in them too. So Jesus didn't have a shortage of little children. There was not a shortage of little Jewish girls who needed the devil cast out of them. And here comes a Gentile wanting it to happen for her child. The question is, what does she do? First of all, she maintains her wits. She don't get emotionally charged up. She stays cool, calm, and collected. She shows great respect. Good God Almighty. And she follows Jesus' lead. This smart woman, quick-witted woman, she speak Jesus' language. She says, since you are going to use an analogy of children eating at the table and giving crumbs after they finish eating to their little house puppies, I'll stay with the same analogy. She said, truth, Lord, but the dogs, if you want to go there, well, we'll go there, but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. When that lady said this to Jesus, the Lord was moved by her faith. The Lord was moved by her worship. The Lord was moved by her body language. And Jesus said, oh, woman, I haven't seen this kind of faith. No, not in Israel. I'll tell you what, I'm moving you. I'm moving you from the back of the line. I'm moving you to the front of the line. Great is your faith. Be it as you wish. He healed her daughter. He worked a miracle. And I wonder if there's somebody here today who will worship the Lord and cry out to him. Woo! And say, Lord, help me. You know, you know your brother, Ray, 
Raymond Moles. That's my guy. I was sitting there looking at him, saying to myself, he's preaching my sermon. Because see, by the time he got up and said all that, that he was saying, Patricia already had my work. And he said, he was with Tasha and Ira. They were somewhere trying to get in. Trying to get in to the, I think the ball game or something. Oh, Lord. And uh, that was a line. Form a line for me, brethren. Y'all coming form a line. Come on, come on. I need a line. Because I need some quick witted people to form a line. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Come form a line. Come and form a line. Slip your shoes on and form this line. Oh, Lord. He said, Tasha said to them, do you want to get in? Do you want to get in? They were way at the back of the line. Oh, ah, somebody is at the back of the line. But how many know that God is able? Yeah, the Lord is able to move you from the back of the line to the front of the line. Oh, Lord, some going on in line. Say, yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They did like Tasha did Ray. She said, come on, come on, follow me. Come on, follow me. People were looking. People were pointing, but he said, come on and follow me. I hear the Lord telling me to tell somebody, come on, ah, come on, ah, come on and follow me. Yeah, yeah, yes. Give him praise. Thank you. You can go and be seen. Give him praise, praise him, like you're at the front of the line. Woo! Somebody broke out in a dance because they're moving from the back of the line to the front of the line. You know what you've been going through. Praise Him for your promotion. Praise the Lord for turning things. For turning things, hey, hey, hey. Yeah! The Lord said, I'm going to do it. The Lord said, I'm going to do it. Shut 
Rejoice! You will scream and rejoice if you believe God.
Oh, I'm just letting the Lord have his way. You got to know sometimes when the most powerful thing that can be said in a move of God like this is nothing. And just let, let the people praise him. Step away and let God move people to the front of the line. What is he doing, what is he doing right now? He's still mushing you. He's changing somebody's fortunes. He hadn't stopped moving yet. He hadn't stopped. He hadn't stopped. Jesus, we worship you right now. We worship you, Lord. We throw kisses. We throw kisses. We adore you. We worship you. We say to you, Lord, Lord, help us. Lord, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be puppies, Lord. We'll be puppies. Just the crumbs. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Somebody's faith has just changed their fortunes. Changed their life. The Bible said the little girl was healed from that very hour. From that very hour things begin to change. From this very hour, I declare, let him have his way. From this very hour, from this very hour, we declare the Lord changing things. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus.